Now, may I introduce the moderator, ASCE Texas Section Vice President-Elect for Educational Affairs, Mr. Russell Carter. Uh, thank you, and welcome to the uh, sixth Texas Section webinar um, for the year 2017. I would like to thank the branches who are hosting viewing sites all across Texas. As the State Association for Civil Engineers, we are happy to provide this service uh, to our engineering community. If you are not a member of ASCE or the Texas Section, I invite you to become a member so that you can benefit from being a part of this professional association. Our speaker today is Larry Goldberg with, excuse me, <clears throat> New Vocus Corporation. Our topic is FRP rebar, improving the sustainability of concrete infrastructure through the use of fiber reinforced polymer rebar. Uh, Mr. Goldberg received his uh, bachelor's degree from Texas A&M and has worked as a engineer for four years. He has 24 years of experience through design, construction of both residential and commercial projects, focusing on both public and private infrastructure, uh, transportation, flood control projects, and has seen various aspects of all that civil engineer does um, throughout their career. He then proceeded to be a vice president for Landev Engineering for three and a half years and currently is the regional sales director for New Vocus Corporation. In two, 34 years of experience as a civil engineer, he is very active with ASCE, serving as the Houston branch president for 2000-2001. And at the section level is our current president-elect and will be president of the Texas section in 2017-2018. And after that, a past president forever. So Larry, um, thank you for presenting this webinar and give the opportunity to see um, what you have for us. Russell, thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Lindsay, thank you also for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, host this uh, webinar today. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, start off just real briefly uh, with a little advertisement on the uh, CECON this year. Uh, I want to encourage everybody to uh, get involved and uh, to be active in it. Um, the uh, CECON this year is going to be in September 20th through the 22nd in San Marcos at the Embassy Suites Conference Center. Uh, the theme this year is uh, resiliency. Um, it's going to be hosted by the Texas Section ASC, but it's open to all civil engineers and industry professionals in the Texas and beyond. So please uh, help uh, uh, spread the word, get active in it. Um, there's going to be a lot of breakout sessions provided by the technical institutes. Uh, you have the ability to learn, uh, earn uh, professional development hours and have networking opportunities. Uh, you'll be able to participate in the industry panel discussions, and there's a lot of uh, sponsorship opportunities throughout at all the different events and uh, components of the conference. Uh, if you're uh, interested in any kind of sponsorship, please contact uh, Travis Ostanasio, um, and there's his contact. You also can contact the uh, uh, Texas Section office for additional information. Uh, you can eat, meet uh, industry suppliers, uh, exhibitor opportunities. Again, David Matoka is uh, coordinating all, all the exhibitor opportunities, so please feel free to uh, uh, be part of that also. Uh, there's technical field trips, uh, as we usually have. You can go online and, again, look at all the opportunities there. Uh, any uh, questions or anything you have, please visit the uh, website. Uh, registration is open. Uh, Anna Flores with Implanters uh, is available, uh, and there's the other contact information for other individuals there. So uh, with that, let's uh, get started. If I can switch over here, y'all bear with me. Okay, usually at this point, I usually ask how many people in the room have uh, are familiar with FRPs, but since I can't see your show of hands, it's not gonna work very well. So um, just a little quick uh, background about myself. Uh, about a, a year or so ago, uh, the Vocus Corporation had come down to uh, Russell Admission with Landev uh, Consultants. 
Um, <clears throat> thank you for coming down to the Lunch and Learn presentation. Uh, I really uh, appreciated the material. I saw the benefits. I saw the value to our industry and uh, the future of infrastructure. Uh, started working uh, with them to incorporate a product. Uh, the Gator Bar is our product. Again, I'm with no Vocus, but our product is Gator Bar. Uh, I was working with uh, New Vocus incorporated into our plans and specs on some of our projects. Uh, the CEO uh, started coming down. The company is uh, located in Amique, Michigan, up there on Lake Superior. I uh, found that uh, Texas and Houston in particular is a, a large user of rebar and concrete. So they focused their marketing effort down in the, the Texas region. Uh, was going back and forth. Uh, had mentioned that they were looking for a uh, replacement. He was kind of getting tired of traveling. Uh, we started talking. Um, I was very interested in the opportunity along with my uh, ability to uh, serve ASCE was a really good fit. Uh, Eric had mentioned to me, that's the CEO, that, uh, hey, Larry, before you uh, offer you anything or we go any further, I want you to truly believe in this product, see where we're headed with it, and I want you to understand and have drank the Kool-Aid. I said, how about if I drink the Gator, drink the Gator Bar? And here I am today, uh, Regional Sales Director in the state of Texas for uh, New Vocus Corporation. So with that, uh, what we're going to talk about today is improving the sustainability of concrete through the use of uh, fiber reinforced polymers. Uh, again, don't know how many of y'all uh, actually have used or are familiar with FRPs. Uh, here's just some copyright material, just the course description. Uh, some of the learning ob objectives that we want to talk about today. Uh, after this presentation, we'll be able to identify some of the differences between FRPs, fiber reinforced polymers, and steel rebar. It's going to help you increase your awareness of the environment, of the benefits of FRP, and understand how it can be incorporated in the long-term sustainability of our infrastructure. This slide here, I want you to consider some things as we're going through this presentation. Does, does corroded rebar become an issue as your concrete projects begin to age? Uh, I know a lot of the engineers probably don't think about that 5, 10, 25 years down the road. The agencies are, are more geared towards that. Does the deteriorating concrete become a concern? Uh, are long-term long -term maintenance budgets a concern? Um, are you looking for improved return on investments uh, in your infrastructure, in your concrete infrastructure in particular? And then are we always interested in reducing our construction costs? This is a big global challenge here. Uh, it's uh, very common amongst uh, uh, bridge structures and a lot of other structures. This one just has to be a really good pictorial example of uh, what goes on in our infrastructure. Uh, personally, uh, early in my career, I um, did some bridge inspection. And uh, sometimes this, this kind of situation would kind of bring uh, a little bit of attention to you, kind of worry you a little bit. Um, we all think of concrete as being impervious as engineers and Owners, we know that the concrete is very impervious. Uh, moisture gets in there, it attacks the rebar, it starts to corrode and expand. Concrete starts falling away from the rebar and you get situations like this. Uh, early on in my career, uh, ACI code uh, used to require two and a half inches of concrete cover to uh, assist with protection of your reinforcement. Today, it's up to three and a half inches. And most of that increase in the concrete cover is due to just trying to protect and uh, guard against deterioration of the rebar. Uh, this is the Pantheon. It's a very old structure, thousands of years old. It's been around. Uh, I used to say it was built without any concrete or, or steel, but I learned there is actually some uh, concrete mixture, lightweight concrete, actually, that was used in this. And then our architect pointed out a couple years ago uh, a couple weeks ago that uh, there was actually some pig iron wrapped in lead. I haven't been able to find anything to substantiate that, but the purpose of this slide is just to show that we can build things to last. Uh, we want to start building things that last longer. The Federal Highway Department, I've heard and seen things that they're looking at a uh, life uh, lifespan of 100 years, opposed to a lot of times we design things for 30 or 50 years. You know, how are we going to get our industry to get there? It's going to take new materials, new thoughts, new designs, things like that in order to uh, increase the sustainability of our infrastructure. If anybody does have any questions, as Lindsay said along the way, please post them in the little chat box and we'll address those uh, best we can uh, at the end of the presentation. So traditional uh, corrosion prevention techniques have been to uh, use epoxy coated rebar, galvanized stainless steel, uh, these type of materials. Uh, it's been found that epoxy coated rebar uh, has some issues that if it's uh, 
uh, damage during construction. It actually accentuates the uh, deterioration of the rebar in some states have actually outlawed it in certain applications. Uh, then you get galvanized and stainless steel, and these materials are, are have a much higher price point uh, when trying to use these on construction sites. Uh, another thing, again, like we talked about, you could increase the cover uh, over your reinforcement in order to protect against that moisture penetration. We could use sacrificial anodes. Uh, for cathodic protection, and we could add a lot of different stuff to concrete in order to try to prove um, or, or slow down the deterioration of the reinforcement. So what are FRPs? FRPs are fiber reinforced polymers. They consist of different types of materials. You've got kind of the most common fibers out there in the industry, the basalt fibers, fiberglass, carbon, aramids. Aramids are like your Kevlar vest. Uh, each one of these types of fibers have different price points, different uh, properties, different characteristics, and uh, sometimes can be used in similar manners, but there again, you need to know the material you're dealing with. There's uh, different types of uh, matrix uh, that, that bind the fibers together, as you can see here. Uh, and it again, it depends on the type of fiber that you're using combined with the type of matrix. Uh, we're all very common and very familiar with uh, a lot of these FRPs, whether we realize it or not, our house, our boats, uh, things of those nature. There's a lot of new um, applications that are being studied and advanced uh, for using uh, composites type materials. You use to hear that word a lot. Uh, so this is something to keep in mind uh, throughout this presentation. Here's a little bit of Latin for you uh, to give the concept of uh, the fiber count. There are about 215,000 individual uh, 17 micron fibers and a number three uh, uh, fiber reinforced polymer. I, I, I counted them myself, so I could tell you that that's the number that's in there. A little bit of history of FRPs. They've been around for quite some time, again, getting more notoriety. Uh, but the first generation was approximately in the 1940s. Uh, military applications looking for stronger, uh, lighter weight materials, steel uh, during some of the war times uh, wasn't very available. Uh, so uh, different countries and agencies were looking for other options to uh, building things uh, without uh, steel. Uh, the focus was mostly on the fiberglass uh, type of polymers. Uh, and reinforcements. Second generation was about the 1960s age. It was uh, more of the composites during uh, the uh, space age, Sputnik type of things, uh, where uh, these type of materials were being looked at for, again, being lighter, stronger, uh, easier to, to work with. Uh, third generation came on, as you can see here. It was kind of searching for the markets and uh, opportunities to um, incorporate these type of products. Uh, the fourth generation started focusing on more uh, how can we advance the fibers, uh, making them stronger, uh, finding other fibers, finding uh, different types of epoxies, and uh, beginning to really move this industry forward. Uh, today's generation of FRPs are really geared more towards, hey, how can we bring this cost down, uh, bring it to market, make it more acceptance, uh, and, and getting it uh, uh, used in other applications. So the market was, uh, again, approximately 30 years old, so or 40 years old uh, for the most part. Uh, it really started taking a stronghold. So it's been around a while. It's, it's not uh, a, a brand new product or a brand new concept. Um, from that, uh, there's been the Rebar Manufacturer Council uh, that works with composites and manufacturing. Uh, they also work with a lot of different agencies coming up with design criteria, manufacturing, uh, properties and standards uh, for use of these type of materials. <clears throat> There's a lot of, uh, not a lot, but here's a, a list of uh, some of the uh, higher end uh, uh, major players in the industries, as you can see here, uh, that uh, available. You can go look uh, these companies up online and see the products and the lines that they offer. Uh, some of the supporting codes, just to give you an overview, the ACI code, uh, there are uh, codes that are out there for design and uh, construction uh, with FRPs. Uh, the Highway AASHTO also has uh, various requirements for use of these type of materials. Um, ASTM, again, with the testing of, uh, of these materials, uh, are available out there and currently in place. 
Uh, several of the DOTs around the country also have FRPs incorporated, including Texas, uh, where they allow uh, FRP use in certain applications within their facilities and infrastructures. Uh, Canada is pretty pretty far advanced ahead of us. Uh, they've been around, uh, started with these materials. They've got a little bit of different uh, uh, climate conditions where they have a lot of de-icing. So Canada has a lot of standards uh, that also that the U.S. Uh, has a uh, reviewed and uh, adopted uh, a lot of really excellent guidelines. <clears throat> the other agency here, uh, ISIS Canada, that's not a terrorist organization. Uh, I'm sure they wish they could go back and change their name at this point, but uh, it actually stands for Intelligent Sensing of Innovative Structures. Uh, from that, uh, they have a lot of different guidelines uh, for the use of FRPs. They've developed this manual number three, and there's a lot of different uh, testing and reports out there that they've been in involved with. Uh, and uh, the reports, when you go back and look at them, uh, where uh, FRPs have been um, implemented into a facility, they go back several years later, to up to 10 years or so, uh, and they find zero deg degradation in these materials, where we generally know that's, that rebar will begin to rust anywhere between or deteriorate around eight or 10 years. This is the uh, University of uh, Sherbeck in Quebec, Canada. Canada. Uh, it is solely designated for the development and advancement of FRPs, as you can see from the photos here. Uh, they are looking at uh, different types of columns, uh, beams, different structural shapes, and finding new applications for these type of materials and learning how they respond. There are also several other um, Universities in the U.S. here that are uh, advancing these materials. Uh, our particular uh, company, Novocus, uh, we've been working with the University of Nebraska, Michigan Tech, uh, University of Houston, uh, Texas, uh, University of Texas, and A&M also uh, have some uh, advancements going on with these types of materials and studies. So like any mousetrap, uh, you know, it's got its right applications, and you've got to learn about the material around about the product that uh, you are working with. So just like with FRPs, you have to understand uh, the material properties for its correct application. Uh, moisture absorption is a, is a kind of a key element with FRPs. Uh, it was identified early on uh, in some of the fiberglass industry. Uh, so they have a limitation to not to exceed uh, 1%. Uh, so generally, these type of products, when you're writing specs, you're looking at specs and codes, you want that moisture absorption to be between about 0.75 and 1%. Um, the glass industry, when they first uh, started, uh, they had some issues with uh, the moisture absorption uh, with the concrete, uh, also some alkalinity. The uh, fiberglass industry has uh, developed uh, different levels of the uh, fiberglass, the like E-glass and S-glass, and uh, have addressed these issues in order to meet these standards and specifications. Uh, the fiber count, again, here you can see uh, by, by requirements, generally they're between 70 to 80 percent uh, fiber, and then again, uh, the remaining portion of that is the epoxy that's holding that together. Uh, everybody wants to know if they melt, if they burn. In our particular case, we hand out these little uh, small, about three inch little samples. Everybody always tells me they look like cigars. They want to know if you can smoke them or if they look like beef jerky. I don't uh, recommend either one of those, uh, but they generally will uh, soften uh, around 250 degrees. Uh, that's the glass transition temperature. You'll see that in a lot of the specifications. Uh, <clears throat> tensile strength, this is one of the beauties and advantages, advantages of um, FRPs, uh, you get a much higher tensile strength. Uh, generally, they range from about 100 to 200 KSI. With steel, we generally use around the 60 KSI steel in most of our designs. Uh, another uh, property of FRPs is the tensile modulus or modulus elasticity. It is lower in steel. It's not as stiff. So you just have to understand the material that you deal with. And these are perfect applications for flat work, a hike and bike trail, sidewalks, uh, parking lots, uh, and eventually into roadways as the industry becomes more and more familiar with them. They have been used in a lot of roadways and have been studied in a lot of roadways and had very good success with that. Uh, but again, you just have to understand your material properties and uh, their applications. Shear strength is lower than the steel. Again, when you're designing with your flat work, you're designing for uh, temperature and shrinkage control. 
you're not really you're not designing for uh, shear strength, but in structural applications you do, so you have to relook at that. Uh, ACI code allows you to bundle up to four bars uh, in order to increase some of your stiffness and some of your shear strength, or you may have to go to a larger diameter bar. In most of your flat work, because of the strength of these type of materials, you can actually go the other way and use a smaller diameter bar. Uh, so if you have a number four listed on a job, generally you can use a number three FRP because of its material properties, and it works very well and very good success. A lot of times if you have like a number three bar, a 12-inch spacing, you could actually go to an 18-inch spacing when you're running through the, the formulas and looking at the uh, uh, design parameters. Again, you just have to understand the materials, the properties of the materials that you're designing for and deal with them accordingly. So here's some of the property differences. Uh, as we talked about, you have a higher tensile strength, the smaller diameter, the lower modulus. Uh, the la the uh, FRPs, uh, they have more of a linear elastic. Uh, we'll show you an example, I think, into this presentation, um, where steel has a plastic deformation. Once it deforms, it stays deformed. With FRPs, they'll actually rebound back and re-straighten themselves out. Uh, again, they're non-conductive. Uh, uh, and uh, you could read the rest of the properties there. So just as a little example of a typical stress strain curve, I think if you could see my pointer on the screen there, generally steel will have a, a, a smaller elastic range uh, before they'll actually hit their yield point. So with 60 KSI steel, uh, you go up to 60 KSI, and then it begins to start deforming and it gets about 18% deformation before it begins to fail. With FRPs, uh, they have an elastic deformation. They will rebound back till they get about 3% of their deformation, and then they end up with a brittle failure. Some of the design advantages of FRPs over steel, again, it's uh, rust-free. They don't corrode. They have a higher uh, physical and mechanical properties. Uh, you get that uh, equivalent uh, tensile strength at the smaller diameters. And it's a lot more durable because um, uh, they last longer. We know that steel, again, like we talked about, will begin to deteriorate um, about 8 to 10 years. We know that the, the FRPs have been in uh, applications uh, 30 or 40 years. Uh, so at this point, we know that they'll uh, last at least twice as long, much longer in reality, but there's not a lot of tests and reports around to substantiate that. But when you go back on the applications where it has, has been installed uh, and they examine sections, there's been no deterioration. Uh, one of the other big advantages is the light, is the weight of the material. It's four to seven times lighter, depends on the material that, and the FRP that you're actually uh, looking at. Uh, but because of this reduced weight, it makes it a greener product. Uh, you reduce your labor. If the laborers uh, can carry uh, more material at a lighter weight, you reduce a lot of the injuries uh, on a job site. Uh, your transportation costs of moving the material around, getting to a job site or getting from the manufacturer to the job site is, is uh, much uh, reduced. Um, again, uh, potential reduction in the concrete uh, as these materials uh, become uh, more and more accepted within the industry. Uh, we, we can see that the industry will start uh, reducing that. A lot of bridge decks, they can are able to use uh, less concrete, which also lightens up the load, which again uh, helps the bridge structure itself and reduces costs there. And they're more sustainable. Uh, these materials generally aren't recyclable, uh, a lot of people think. They're not recyclable in the way that you could just uh, melt them down and reuse them. But because uh, they're rock or fiber, you can just break them up with the concrete. You don't have to uh, spend that extra expense of removing uh, steel uh, like you would with steel, removing it from the concrete when you go to replace a section. So again, it's more sustainable. It doesn't corrode, doesn't deteriorate. Uh, this is just an example of a truckload of uh, FRPs, 450,000 feet versus 60,000 feet of equivalent number four steel. So in this case, this is seven uh, FRPs to the one steel bar. Just to show you the advantage of being able to put that much on a truckload and being able to transport it from a manufacturer to a, to a site or distributor. Again, because it's so much lighter, uh, this is a half-ton pickup truck uh, with, a, with a ladder rack on top. It's got 720 pounds of 8,000 feet of uh, FRPs. Uh, generally, it's the same equivalent. 8,000 feet would be about 5,000 pounds 
Uh, so again, making it easier to um, transport to a job site, freeing up some trailers that you put other equipment on, and reducing your cost and labor savings uh, when using FRPs. So let's uh, focus a little bit on the basalt fiber versus uh, other types of fibers. The industry has been uh, pretty much established around the glass and the carbon type fibers where FRP fills that gap and is really making its way into the marketplace now. <clears throat> so why basalt? Um, again, it's made from a rock. We'll talk about that here in a minute. It's made from an inorganic igneous rock, a volcanic rock that's uh, very abundant throughout. Uh, it's got very similar properties with uh, coefficient of thermal expansion as with concrete. Steel is also pretty close to the same, uh, but there's other things with the steel because of its stiffness that causes some internal stressing. We'll talk about that a little bit into the presentation. Again, you have the advantages of the higher tensile properties, um, and uh, basalt uh, provides these uh, very well. Uh, again, it's very appealing to the environment and uh, uh, kind of fills that gap in between the carbon and the uh, uh, fiberglass. So this is a picture of uh, volcanic rock, igneous rock. It's very abundant globally. You uh, take this material, you break it up, you wash it, uh, you put it in a furnace about 1800 degrees Celsius. Uh, you melt it all along down a little uh, uh, train to where it gets to a, um, a, it was called a platinum bearing. It's a rectangular facility there. It's got a bunch of little holes in it. Uh, you drip the material out the bottom of this uh, platinum bearing. You wind it up into bobbins and you produce uh, basalt fibers. From there, you uh, bind them together with the epoxies, creating the uh, rebar. So another big advantage of using uh, basalt, if I was to take about 20 gigajoules of energy to produce uh, a ton of steel, I could take uh, that same 20 gigajoules of energy to produce uh, about seven times, 6.6 .6 times the amount of uh, fiber. Uh, from that, you produce more uh, FRP. So therefore, making it a greener product along with the savings of the transportation. So again, we kind of touched on it earlier, the end of life. Uh, again, you can crush this up with uh, concrete because it is a, a rock type of material. So you, there's no need on pulling out your reinforcement at the end. Again, because of its uh, material properties, you're increasing the service life and uh, increasing its life cycle. Um, it's definitely uh, more aesthetically pleasing. What I mean by that is when uh, the concrete starts to, to rust or deteriorate, uh, with the uh, reinforcement starts to deteriorate. You don't get the rust stains, uh, you don't get the cracking uh, because of the uh, erosion and corrosion of the reinforcing with steel. So with the FRPs, it's a big advantage over the steel and becomes uh, a much better, cleaner product out in the environment. When everybody hears of fiber, they immediately think of asbestos fibers. Asbestos fibers are made of a uh, crystalline silica, much smaller crystals, cool differently, gets caught in our systems, causes health issues. Uh, with the fiberglass and basalt fibers, they're amorphous silicas. They don't uh, uh, create those same health issues. Um, if you ever go back and look at a safety data sheet for steel, it'll actually uh, surprise you in some of the uh, materials that are within steel and the health issues that actually steel can uh, cause. Uh, also, another advantage of using the FRPs is that uh, when you're on a job site, you could use a small grinding battery powered uh, grinding wheel to cut the material. You don't need the big uh, gas powered uh, fuel uh, emitting, spark emitting uh, chop saws that are used to uh, cut the steel. So again, making it a safer, uh, easier, greener product, uh, less equipment on a job site. So we'll talk about the concrete since we're uh, talking about composite types of material here. You guys are all, well not all, but I don't know who the audience is, but uh, concrete is a, a composite material. Um, it's one of the oldest forms of construction materials out there. Uh, it works very well with the FRPs uh, between uh, the uh, uh, concrete and the FRPs. Uh, concrete properties, uh, you all guys are very familiar with that, uh, it's density, it's compressive strength. The concrete is used for its compressive strength where your reinforcement's there for your tensile. Uh, and again, in your flat work, it's there for your shrinkage and temperature control uh, of the concrete uh, as it's curing, going through its uh, hydration. Uh, so you can see the properties here of concrete. Uh, one thing to note that 
Concrete will shrink according to ACI and other codes and stuff and studies. Approximately a sixteenth of inch for every ten feet. So this is what we're kind of this is what we're what we're working on in order to control uh, is the shrinking and cracking and and uh, putting the cracks uh, where we want them and not let it randomly uh, and uh, reducing the amount of cracks that are to show up in our concrete. Uh, facilities because as you all know when uh, concrete begins to crack the moisture gets down there immediately starts attacking the uh, steel that's in there that's where you get these rust spots on the surface that's where your deterioration starts once that process is underway it uh, doesn't uh, get any better so some of your concrete design uh, considerations again uh, when you're designing for your concrete uh, you're looking at its compressive strength for the property the reinforcements there for the tensile strength and because it's a composite we're trying to balance between the two materials uh, another key component of when we're talking the flat work is your subgrade preparation we want to make sure that the subgrade is uh, uh, very well compacted uh, if not the moisture comes in down through the uh, pavement uh, it gets down into the subgrade, gets into the uh, loose capillaries, um, and begins to loosen up the uh, subgrade. So it's very important to get really good compaction and get a good specification on the compaction of your subgrade. Um, another key issue is to uh, pay attention to the sizing and spacing of your reinforcing. Again, we're trying to look at our uh, control joints. We'll talk about that here in a minute. And then use of uh, reinforcing chairs, use those the same uh, as steel uh, for FRPs. So the need for uh, re rebar or reinforcing in our concrete pavements, uh, we're very familiar with the different bar sizes. But the ACI code, uh, this is right out of the ACI code here, the sole function of reinforcing is to hold together the fracture faces if cracks form. Uh, and that's the sole, the, really the big purpose of putting reinforcement into our concrete structures. Um, again, the joints, uh, is very important to put the joints at the uh, right spacing uh, and location in order to uh, reduce this amount of cracking in order to uh, preserve our uh, infrastructure, our concrete infrastructures. So there's different types of joints out there. Again, this is all in the ACI code. You can go back and uh, refer to it and, and look it up. Uh, there's contraction joints, construction joints, isolation joints. Uh, again, the codes, uh, very specific guidelines on uh, the use of these in placement. Uh, it's based on the different thicknesses of your concrete section. Uh, they really recommend to have uh, some type of uh, control joint no further or greater than about 15 feet. Uh, I know in my career, a lot of contractors try to push this to 20 feet with no uh, type of interim uh, type of uh, uh, control joint in between, you get the random cracking, and then it becomes a big issue later into the job site. Uh, contraction joints, there's different forms of those. Again, you can look at that uh, through ACI, uh, but it's uh, providing some type of a saw, saw, saw cut joint uh, somewhere within the uh, uh, section. Again, try to um, evenly space out uh, this distance between the 20-foot joints, uh, reducing that down to the 10 or 15 uh, spacing. Uh, you have contraction joints. There's different types of sawing, the early cuts. There's rules and guidelines uh, for uh, following that and making sure those are implemented. Just need to look at your plans and your specs to make sure they conform with ACI uh, codes on that. Uh, like I said, a lot of things in the field kind of just kind of happen sometimes. Um, again, we have our load transfer, our construction joints. Uh, again, those are very important in order to transfer the load when you do have a cold joint between uh, construction joints, when you've stopped and started from uh, one pour to another for maybe a day to, uh, to day uh, pouring process or operation. And we also have isolation joints, and sometimes you want structures to be uh, move uniformly. Sometimes we want to separate them. As, may have a sidewalk that's right up to a building and you do want that to be uh, uniformly moved with it sometimes we don't so isolation joint is also another uh, joint that is used in order to allow the concrete to move and uh, uh, reduce the amount of cracking and uh, function properly uh, ACI code also has a, a, a layout and recommended suggestions. Uh, again, you want to make sure that uh, when you're lining up your uh, control joints, uh, saw joints, that they match up in the curb also. I've been up to a lot of job sites 
where your pavements, such as in a parking lot, has got an expansion joint, and then the curb is poured uh, continuously over that joint. When the expansion joint starts to move, it's going to crack that uh, uh, curbing. So you want to line those up, uh, making sure that those line up. Again, your isolation joints, your 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 um, control joints. Uh, you want to avoid acute angles. A lot of times we run these up and you get a little sliver up here in the corners. That's immediate uh, location for concrete to crack uh, because there's not either enough reinforcement in there or enough concrete to uh, offset loading when it occurs or just during the shrinkage uh, when it's curing. So you want to make sure that you don't have any really tight uh, acute angles. You want to come out away from the curbs or the edge of the pavement uh, a couple feet before you uh, uh, and then turn it back into it. And again, ACI has a lot of codes uh, that uh, lay out the requirements for this. Um, spacing and reinforcement. Again, there's formulas. There's a set of formulas for both uh, use of steel and also for the use of uh, FRPs uh, that ACI has laid out. Um, these are the two formulas here. You can go through and find these formulas. You can do the math yourself. We're not going to go into a lot of uh, detail on these. But just want to make you aware of that there are uh, formulas and codes and requirements out there in order to uh, determine the amount of spacing and uh, reinforcement that is used in your concrete. Uh, parts of the country don't even use reinforcement. They're built on uh, different types of subgrades, you know, more staple subgrades. Uh, here in uh, Houston, particularly, and across Texas, there are several locations. We have very expansive clays. Uh, geotechs and engineers, uh, being the conservative individuals that we are, will uh, beef this reinforcement up in order to compensate for some of the uh, uh, movement of the subgrade. Again, if you have really good compacted subgrade, it reduces or stabilized subgrades. It reduces that uh, shrink and uh, swell of your subgrades. Therefore, you could reduce uh, some of the reinforcement that's needed uh, for sh your shrinkage and temperature control. Everybody wants to know, can you tie it the same way? FRP's uh, ACI code also allows uh, the same um, methods to be used for tying of uh, rebar uh, or FRPs. Uh, you can use wire ties, coated wire ties, aluminum, zip ties. Uh, there's some new technology out there called a code clip, a little plastic uh, clip that's utilized in a uh, like an air gun, like a nail gun. Uh, the one thing with the uh, unprotected, just straight wire ties uh, in your smaller, uh, like hiking bike trails and sidewalks, a lot of times when the uh, uh, laborers out there in the field, when they're twisting those, they leave the little pigtails column uh, kind of pointing upwards. When you pour that concrete, they come up to the surface, also creating um, little rust spots in there. I had an architect tell me the other day that's the way that they get a pattern in the concrete. Uh, we all laughed about that. That's pretty funny. But uh, what they should do is bend that down and tuck it up under or cut it off. So in your specifications, if you're allowing just plain wire ties, uh, you really want to make sure that that gets done. Otherwise, uh, you get all these little rust spots. When that little uncoated wire begins to rust, it's the first thing it rusts all the way through, again, allowing a capillary of water to seep down to the uh, steel reinforcement, start corroding it. With FRPs, another advantage is you don't get that. Uh, everybody wants to know if you can bend FRPs, uh, just like with steel, you'd have to send them to fabricators uh, ahead of time to get bends done. You need to bend any sharp angled uh, with FRPs prior to the epoxy setting, but they can be done, and these are some general shapes that are used in the industry. Uh, you can take a piece about 20 foot long and generally uh, be able to bend, especially basalt FRPs, to about a three, or two to three, four foot radius, depends on uh, the size of the bar that you can actually uh, uh, make a radius out in the field opposed to an abrupt bend, but they can be used, they are used, uh, and are available. Uh, again, here's, uh, it's very important to put the chairs, and get chairs up underneath uh, your reinforcement. Uh, a lot of times that reinforcement ends up at the bottom of your pores. The uh, laborers reach down, they pick it up, and you have no idea where it is. Another advantage if that does occur and uh, the laborers pull it up and it's only an inch from the surface, um, it doesn't begin to corrode and rust. It'll, it'll uh, make the concrete a lot more durable where with the uh, steel, uh, moisture begins to attack it uh, immediately, not immediately, but down the road at some point will start to uh, spall off the, the corroding rebar. So with the FRPs, uh, eliminates that uh, potential if it is uh, close to the surface. Uh, so this is just some good examples of some uncontrolled cracking where uh, 
joint spacing was uh, probably not what it should have been. Uh, we're all very familiar with cracked uh, parking lots, hiking bike trails, sidewalks, driveways, uh, these type of situations. And so with FRPs, it reduces this uh, due to the uh, nature of the material, uh, the higher strengths that are available with the FRPs, a little more flexibility, reduces some of that cracking. Uh, there's a couple studies out there. Uh, there's one by uh, a gentleman named Steve uh, Williams called the Williams Study. Uh, he looked at the uh, uh, the advantages of a more uh, of a lower tensile uh, modulus, uh, more flexibility. Uh, looking at uh, has uh, we have we as an industry uh, gotten too stiff with our concrete sections and uh, creating additional cracking. A lot of the uh, original or Early on, uh, continuous reinforced pavement sections. I know here in the at least the Houston area, after they were poured, several years later there was cracks about every three feet. Uh, studies that have been done, which is this West Virginia study, uh, was funded by the Federal Highway Department, uh, where they went in and they paved uh, half of a highway section with uh, fiber uh, FRPs, fiberglass FRPs. The other half with steel. Um, they was there to uh, to analyze. Uh, crack spacing uh, with the cracks on the uh, steel. The cracks showed up approximately every three feet. With the FRPs, they were uh, about every eight feet, seven to eight feet. Uh, a little bit wider crack, but it was within the allowable tolerances. Uh, when they removed uh, pavement sections on uh, both the uh, sections, the steel had already started to deteriorate where there was no deterioration in the uh, fiber uh, glass uh, section. Um, so uh, the University of Texas and the University of Texas, the University of Texas and TxDOT uh, uh, got together. And there's an ACI formula that can be used to determine this crack spacing and continuous reinforced pavements. Uh, came up with a little crack calculator that you can get a hold of, and uh, you basically put your uh, section properties into the, the formula there. So taking a half-inch steel rebar at 18 inches on center, 7-inch thick, as you can see here, you would end up with crack spacing about a, about every three feet at the end of 120 days. Do the same configuration with the FRPs. You end up with crack spacing about every seven feet. It's a little wider crack due to the uh, lower tensile modulus, not as stiff, but it allows the concrete to basically breathe a little bit and move around, uh, allowing less cracking uh, within your infrastructure there. Uh, so most of the stuff here you could read over, uh, but we've discussed. Just a quick little summary of that. Again, FRP in the pavements allow for higher uh, strength, uh, lower modulus, again, reducing a lot of your stresses within the concrete. It's also very cool to the touch. Parts of the country uh, have where the heat, the rebar heats up, and then if it cools too, I mean, once the concrete's poured, you get too much heat in that uh, reinforcement. It actually calls hot cracking that surfaces to the it comes to the surface of the concrete, spalling away the concrete due to the heat of the, the reinforcement. Uh, that is reduced or eliminated uh, with the FRPs. I'm just going to show you a little quick video here. Uh, one of the advantages of FRPs is to be able to build grids over to the side. Uh, this is a 20 foot by 20 foot grid. You can see the weight differential there. Uh, but if you were to uh, do your subgrade, set your uh, forms all in place, be build grids to the side, this is a real quick advantage of that. This particular grid was put together with the coated clip that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, but you can see that two individuals were able to pick up a 20 foot by 20 foot grid, put it in place. Uh, again, this is uh, reducing the, your, your construction time out of a job site because now you don't have to wait till all your forms and everything gets set or it take six or eight guys or a piece of equipment to be able to put this in place. Another advantage is if uh, you put this, uh, your reinforcement in, in the forms and it rains, you find out you have to go back and do something with the subgrade, you just lift this back out. You don't have to unassemble uh, any of the grid. So another big advantage. Uh, again, here's a, an example of building a set of grids over to the side and then taking them out to the job site on a trailer. Two individuals can then just lay out the grid very quickly. So if you have a very uniform, like a parking lot or a street or a hike and bike trail, very uniform sections, you can pre-build your grids. You could even do this during inclement weather, uh, build them in a shop or a shed or underneath part of the building somewhere. Uh, 
put your grids together, two guys can take them and pick them up and drop them into place. Or two females, two individuals, let me clarify that. <laughs> So where have uh, FRPs generally been used in the past? Uh, they've generally been used in uh, very specific uh, applications uh, where you have to have uh, particular physical or mechanical properties of the FRPs. Uh, but due to their price point, they're generally three or four times more expensive. But here, uh, the price is starting to come down until now. We're starting to be more and more competitive with these type of materials to uh, use them in other applications. Um, a lot of these uh, type of materials are used like in MRI rooms where you can't have any interference uh, with the equipment that's in there with the steel. Uh, some of the toll uh, plazas are now utilizing uh, FRP in the slabs because they're having interference uh, with the, uh, the uh, monitoring equipment uh, in the toll plazas. Um, so now it opens up the market uh, to the pavement sidewalks, hike and bike trails, slow pavings. Here's some examples of those. Uh, because it builds faster, it's less expensive, and it's a higher quality of product, making more uh, a longer sustainability in our infrastructures. This is an example of a project here in the Houston area. Uh, it was a Generation Park. It doesn't have any of the FRPs in it. They're looking at them uh, to incorporate it in some upcoming projects. But it was a good example of uh, you had a detention pond up in the northern area here that had hike and bike trail, slow paving. Uh, again, um, parking lots, driveways, storage yards, uh, perfect application for FRPs, uh, hike and bike trail system that's going to go around throughout this 4,000 acre development. So just to give you some examples of uh, where uh, these type of products can be used very easily. Uh, here's just a quick overview of some pictures and applications uh, where the materials like this have been used already. Uh, storage yard, you can see here some hiking, uh, some sidewalk and driveways for Harris County Precinct. Uh, everybody wants to know if you could just dial it into the existing pavement. Uh, again, that uh, is, uh, is used the same way, overlap links, lap links, and embedment links. Uh, material storage slab, it was a slab that was done for uh, uh, Harris County Toll Road, where they had some de-icing materials that they stored, it was leaching through and causing some issues with uh, the, the steel reinforcement by using FRPs, eliminated that. Uh, Port of Houston, some sidewalks, some, uh, this is a, a van rental facility, about a four and a half acre that used uh, FRPs throughout. Uh, there's about 50,000 uh, linear feet of uh, reinforcement on this one half uh, on this one trailer pulled by a half ton pickup truck. Again, making it easier to get to the job site. Uh, this was a parking lot expansion where they built the grids over to the side, dropped them in place, and poured the concrete. Uh, warehouse, office, uh, storage yard, and access drive. Uh, this again shows the flexibility of the material going around a curve uh, section over in the, the left hand photo there. The uh, laborers, when they were laying it out, uh, they didn't have to try to pre-bend the uh, reinforcement to fit the curve. They were able to tie one in and then walk it around with their foot, uh, again, uh, making it very easy and uh, quicker to, to construct with. Some hike and bike trails up in the Sugarland, uh, some slope paving in Fort Worth. Uh, again, uh, some roadway repair sections, as you can see here, some other hike and bike trails, a little retaining wall. Uh, street repair uh, down in the Beaumont area. Just to give you an overview of some of the applications where FRPs can be used and they're performing very well. Uh, what uh, what you can do when you're trying to uh, use FRPs, especially the basalt FRP, is incorporate a paragraph like this into your plans and specifications that basalt fiber reinforced polymer bars for concrete reinforcement can be used as an alternate to number three and number four. Uh, it's generally kind of the, the range uh, in uh, most of these type of uh, facilities to replace or as an alternate to reinforcing steel uh, in these type of applications. Uh, this is a great way to incorporate it into the, the plans. Uh, that way the uh, engineers, when they go out to bid, are able to at least get a, a, a quote on them and uh, be able to uh, have an opportunity to install them on your projects. Gets the uh, client and the uh, uh, agencies on board by incorporating these early on. So I encourage everybody to look at this and get this incorporated into your plans for the correct applications. Just in summer, we went through a lot uh, right about on time here, but just uh, some of the uh, benefits that we talked about, uh, it's very innovative. Uh, you get uh, a lot better, uh, longer lasting, uh, higher return on your investment, again, because of the non-corrosiveness, as you can see. Uh, we've gone through a lot of this just in summary.
so that ends that presentation. And if y'all will just give me another minute here, what I would like to do is just uh, give you a quick overview from my company uh, on our product, uh, just to show you some of the applications, uh, a kind of a general summary of the product. Gator Bar is a fiber reinforced polymer rebar developed by Nuvocus Corporation. It extends the life of concrete such as slab on grade, floors, patios, and parking structures. When steel rebar rusts, it expands and cracks the concrete around it. Gator Bar will never corrode thanks to its advanced polymer technology. Gator Bar is stronger than steel and much lighter. This bundle contains 25 pieces of number 3 Gator Bar. It weighs only 47 pounds and is easily carried by one person. In comparison, the equivalent bundle of steel rebar weighs over 300 pounds. This means Gator Bar can be transported on a pickup rack, freeing up trailers for other equipment. With Gator Bar, chair grids are quicker to set up and easier to work with. Gator Bar can be walked on and driven over by vehicles. It springs back, staying centered in the slab. Manufactured by Nuvocus Corporation from environmentally friendly basalt fibers, Gator Bar is price comparable to steel, which keeps budgets on track while resulting in concrete that outlasts traditional steel reinforced concrete. Invest for the long haul without a budget increase. Get Gator Bar for your next infrastructure project. Uh, just wanted to give you a quick overview, a good summary. Uh, our particular company, uh, one of the advantages that's going on in the marketplace, again, these type of materials are generally manufactured about 8 to 10 feet per minute. Uh, with our particular product, uh, we're able to uh, increase that production speed again, bringing down the price. Uh, we're we're up in uh, Michigan, which is on Lake Superior. I encourage everybody to uh, go and visit uh, the Upper Peninsula. It's a great place if you like hiking and biking. Uh, a couple months out of the year, uh, about uh, June through about September. If you like snow, you can go visit it the rest of the year. Um, just did want to show you. Let's see, we talked. We talked. Discussed the uh, Coda Clip uh, earlier. I just want to give you a quick uh, example of uh, what I was talking about. There's some new technology out there. We don't sell this, uh, but it is available uh, in areas uh, where maybe labor is not as abundant. Uh, but it also allows one individual to uh, assemble grids. Again, uh, this is a little demonstration that we did. Uh, we lay some carpets down. You can lay out your grid, use that, and then, as you all saw before, uh, uh, pick them up and lay them into a location, into the forms. Um, with that, that concludes my presentation. Uh, turn it back over to uh, Russell. I don't know if there's any questions out there. I know we're pretty much right on time. Uh, yeah, we're pretty good on time. Um, let's see, there are a couple of questions that we got here. Uh, um, where does TxDOT stand on the uh, Basalt FRP usage? OK. Uh, TxDOT doesn't currently have Basalt incorporated into their specifications. They do have a spec on FRP. Uh, so they have asked us to provide them with some of our particular material that they're doing in-house testing. Uh, they're looking at doing a couple demonstration projects uh, later this year, uh, incorporating it and then seeing. So moving moving along really well. Uh, they're really looking at the FRPs uh, in particular in the, in the basalt. Uh, they're looking at lot, uh, reducing the weights of their bridge structures. I just mentioned right here that uh, there was recently a bridge completed down in the Florida region called Halls River Bridge. It's like almost 100% FRPs. There's some steel conduits and a little bit of, uh, of uh, some cabling that's in there. Uh, but you can look that up online just to show you that some of the DOTs and some of the applications uh, where the whole bridge structure from the beams to the columns to the bridge deck, uh, rails, uh, and walls uh, were all FRP. So it's a very innovative uh, uh, wave 
uh, that's coming along. The industry is really studying these materials. Again, like I said earlier, um, the Federal Highway Department is looking at how can we make our, our infrastructure more sustainable. Uh, one of the meetings we had with uh, TxDOT in reference to these, uh, they had mentioned that they're actually looking at galvanized and stainless steel rebar uh, and try to, to extend the life of the infrastructure. All right, so TxDOT's looking at it. Progress will be made. Um, yeah. How uh, tight of a curve or bend can you work into the FRP? Okay. Again, like mentioned earlier, that uh, you can take a you know depends on the FRMT and the FRP and the, the, the epoxies and the fibers that are in there. Uh, you can uh, bend them into radiuses. You need to take those uh, and uh, pre-bend those before the epoxies uh, harden up. Uh, it's my understanding that there are actually some companies out there that are looking at trying to come up with an epoxy that you could heat up and actually uh, do some forming out in the field, but that's not uh, uh, available to the market that I'm aware of yet. Uh, but uh, So you would just have to plan accordingly and uh, uh, get with your manufacturer of your FRP and just request those ahead of time. Another beauty of uh, the FRPs, because they're so much lighter, uh, if you were build um, a couple hundred of a 90 degree bend, they're so much lighter, you can put them in a box. In general, you can UPS them or FedEx them uh, overnight out to a job site, opposed to having to put them on a pallet and ship them from a fabricator. Uh, so uh, you can get them to a job site very easily. Uh, but bends are available in different structural shapes, as we saw uh, at the University of Sherbrooke in Quebec, Canada. They're studying all kinds of uh, structural uh, shapes that are available out on the market. All right. Well, we are uh, trying to stay on time. So if anyone else has any questions, please email them to us, and we will get them to Larry and get you a response. Uh, once again, I want to thank you for participating in today's ASCE Texas Section webinar. As mentioned before, individual registrants should receive an attendance acknowledgement without further action. For those attending with a group, the site coordinator will receive the PDH certificate for distribution. July's webinar will be available on the section's uh, website soon. Uh, I invite you to visit the Texas, the Texas Section website texasce.org to register for the webinar, to learn more about the association and to take advantage of the benefits of membership. You can also watch the 2016's recorded webinars on demand and earn your PDHs. I'm always available for your questions. Hope to hear from you soon. Thank you for your attendance and have a great day. And we'd like to see everybody at the CECON. So please spread the word and get those out to uh, non-ASC members and uh, anyone who would be interested in learning about resiliency. Thank you, Russell. Thank you. Thank you. This will conclude today's webinar. I will respond to unanswered questions via email to today's webinar attendees. The session will now close.